first messages that you are supposed to receive from yourself and from the universe, it had probably happened this week. Uh, a topic that's insistingly coming or something to be seen or resolved. That's what the last week was about. And yeah. for us too, there was an insisting topic coming, like whatever we open, whatever we watch, wherever we go, we have one big topic uh, coming up, which is foundation of the sharing. It's the Buddhist big question about suffering and how to deal with it, how to live with it, what to do with it. And, and what is its purpose? And what is its purpose? And how to integrate suffering in our current understanding of things. So then the big question that comes up, and if you notice this uh, season is actually a progression of sessions that we have in topics. So last week, it was really about resurrecting to our true divine self. So the question this week is, okay, we are there, what now? So where do we go when we are... Uh, our beautiful, authentic selves. Exactly. So is it enough to just be ourselves? Or how do we interact with the world? How do we interface with the world that probably has a lot of people who are not there yet? So that's what we would like to open the session with. It's to kind of contemplate a little bit this uh, slogan, just be yourself. And uh, what it means to for you guys. And I wish also Lisa was here because that's one of her specialty to actually work, uh, to try to, <laughs> to <laughs> force, <laughs> forcefully put her true self in contact with whoever is ready or not. So it's really cool to see what the interactions are. <laughs> So if she joins, we will love to, to include her in the discussion. But uh, how about you guys? What is your, how important is it for you to act as your true self at, and, all uh, at all times and with everyone? Or are you that only with some people? Or how does that integrate in the environment in which you live right now? So in one question is, are you just yourself? So yes, Anna, <laughs> let's start with you. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> so beautiful to be here. Um, yes, it's such a, such a big question. And uh, I have to laugh because it came so strongly for me yesterday, this question. And in a very interesting context. Uh, so I just started the studies I was telling you about last week. And yesterday we had like the first Zoom working group. Mm. And um, basically what came up super strongly for me is at all the question, what is the authentic me? Like, who am I really? Like, if I was given, you know, in my childhood, the safe space to actually, uh, you know, like uh, probe it safely, right? But I wasn't because I was too much. Everything was too much. If, my, if I was super joyous, it was too much. If I was sad, it was too much. And then basically I, I learned to kind of shrink. And actually now I have this very big question. What is my authentic self at all? Because I was never able to, to, to you know, to, to figure out when I was small. And, and yeah, obviously, you know, I think, or I felt for, for a long time, I am authentic in the sense that, you know, I speak what I think, I speak my truth. But then I also noticed how, um, how um, I'm, you know, like putting myself back, you know, like not really living the, the fullness of whatever I may be and not even knowing what this fullness may be. So this is even more interesting, right? And the interesting thing was that um, I asked the group yesterday, and my wish would be, I said, to, you know, be able to... Uh, safely do just that kind of discover myself you know with in in the in the full range of my emotions this and that and then in the end i kind of added no no but you know i won't make anyone uncomfortable <laughs> you know what i mean and i was like shit and then because someone pointed to that you know and i was like oh my god exactly that so i am again holding myself back right because i don't want to make people uncomfortable 
so uh, yeah, it's such a big question to me. And uh, actually, like uh, my full commitment, I feel this year is to, to yeah, to find it out. How would my my true, full, authentic expression look like? You know, in a way that's that's yeah, that's uh, authentic and true to to my soul. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Mm, beautiful. Well, wonderful. Thank yes, you. we will. Uh, this is the core of uh, what we want to examine today. Mm -hmm. How to be your authentic self uh, without being burdened or disturbing or without clashing or without mm -hmm. putting yourself in, uh, in trouble. How to do that? Mm -hmm. Is it even possible? Yeah. Or, so, it, or is it important? So, uh -huh. Bella. Bella. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, yeah, yes, you know, I didn't participate in the resurrection uh, webinar because I was driving. So I am really, really eager to do it since there's still a window. <laughs> so I'm going to watch and do the whole ritual because, you know, this question that I, I, I looked at what was going to be the topic. And it, at first it looked so simple, right? I was like, just being yourself like what are we going to talk about for two hours and then I started thinking about each of the words and each of the <laughs> and I was like oh my god this is like the question right <laughs> like, it's <laughs> the million dollar question and and for me each part of it is so uh so just like dramatically important in my life right now like you have no idea so it's like first of all the idea of like what is yourself right the, the and I was saying I have exactly it's the same issue, which is, uh, you know, growing up, I also felt like I was told, you know, not to be too loud, not to be, you know, moving too much. And, uh, you know, I'm a Gemini. So I, everyone kept telling me, oh, my God, or to my parents, you have two kids, right? Like, no, and, and I was only just me. <laughs> so people were like, you know, just afraid of my uh, energy almost in, in a joking way, but in a way that made me really like keep keep to myself a lot. And um, the theme keeps repeating, right, in my life where I feel like um, when I start being myself too much, people either people get away from me or I, I don't know, it, it might be like a kind of a my own thing where I push them at a safe distance, right? So it's like, uh, it's safe to look at me from a distance, but like when I come close, it's not. Like that's kind of a theme that I'm starting to get. So being myself, like what does that even mean? And is it? Is it important or am I supposed to, you know, conform with the way that people are to, to fit in to the relationship, society, things like that. And then also the, the, the part of being, right? Like, um, because we're, we're taught to be doing instead of being. And so what are we supposed to be, what does this being uh, mean in order to be ourselves, right? So for example, like I can say, you know, singing is a part of me, but it's, singing is actually doing so you know what I mean like uh, contemplating that aspect of uh, how can we just be right and that that's I would love to hear your thoughts on that because for me it's um, the idea of not doing anything is so loaded right like I always it's almost like in order to express who I am I have to be doing things but I know that's not really the case so uh, you know, and also, you know, the, the part of just, right. Cause it's so complex actually, because you know, when you, when you start, um, projecting yourself out there in your real self, like you get so much resistance. And just this week, you know, I was, uh, told by a good friend to like, I could not say those things or I could not do these things. Right. Like just directly. And I was like, wait, what? You're telling me I can't be my like you know and, and then you start so anyways there's a lot of I just I'm really curious how you would unpack all of those aspects of it and it's a really really big topic for me so thanks yeah thank you Bella thank you and then thank you for pointing to that word just yeah because there is a part of the key in that just yeah mm -hmm. and uh Zane will know all about, about uh, just because that uh, is her last name so so yeah wonderful wonderful thank you Bella. yeah thank you uh-huh how about uh how about hannah who uh who 
created her stage name related in the topic. Who just needs to be herself in <laughs> Germany now after years in Bali. Uh, yes, that was my revelation of the week. Like I started publishing my music two, week, uh, two years ago and I, I didn't really feel like an artist name that was like burning. So I just chose my first name. I didn't like so much the influence of my father's surname and my music. Mm -hmm. And I had the signs all the time, people trying to look me up on Spotify, couldn't find me, it was quite difficult. And so this week I took the step, it's a little bit of a hassle and you kind of lose some followers and a little bit you build up, but I just renamed myself to uh, Hannah Here Now, which uh, is interesting because I, I do feel that in Germany I'm more restricted in really being myself and kind of feeling what are the opinions and I'm not a person trying to uh, put my opinion on other people's heads. So I express it if I'm asked to, but if other people have strong opinion, I just step back and I let them be. And I'm not really interested in defending myself. So um, I can definitely see that, especially here, I'm a little bit like more hesitant in expressing who I am and what I do and slowly making some good experiences where I'm sharing and with a music offering the other day on that new platform, had a good experience of how people being appreciative. And I had prejudice that it wouldn't be the right space to share it because I'm so used to that it's fitting to Bali and it fits to Bali people. And that's where I can express. So um, yeah, I would like to work on the part that is just being myself. It's not that easy, mm. yeah. Thank you, thank you, honey. Aha, uh -huh. uh, Miriam. Hello, good evening from Bali. Hi. <laughs> well, actually, this whole last year, I realize has been like a, a big transformational process for me, like letting go more and more of my judgments, and that I want to persuade people into my ideas and more and more into being, into more and more being myself, actually. Um, and this morning, I even got the last bit. Um, I'm, I'm many days now, I'm following uh, a man who is um, singing uh, the, the in Aramaic, the, 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 the Lord's Prayer, or Lord's and Divine um, Mother Prayer. So he's offering that five times a day to keep to keep the frequency high. He said, like the Muslims are praying five times a day. And so if you do it every three hours, you keep the frequency high. And at seven in the morning, and he lives just nearby my house. So this morning I joined live at his place instead of on Zoom. And I realized he has an amazing voice. And in the morning he's singing and he sang just full on and I realized the whole neighborhood is hearing him. And my kind of second nature became all over my life uh, to, to be aware of others, to not, you know, don't sing or don't do things that others can bother. And this morning it was so pure and so beautiful and he was just doing it and he wasn't bothered by motorbikes going by. And I thought, wow. Wow. And I felt something shifted in me as well, you know, like, wow, he's just sending out this frequency into the whole neighborhood. I'm not going to 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 hold myself back anymore in that. I mean, I was already on the way, but this this morning, really something shifted there by listening to him and, and how what it did to me it was really beautiful. And then I went to the waterfall, a waterfall in a canyon nearby in Boncasa. So you could scream it all out and letting go of whatever you don't want anymore. So I had quite some things and then inviting in tomorrow what I would like more. Mm. But overall, I feel more that I'm becoming more being, <laughs> like doing whatever or being what what i feel in that moment and not yeah as i said not trying to persuade people anymore or or judging or whatever but just and i'm getting more and more joyful so i'm really happy with that yeah mm. 
So I feel at the moment that is what I what I can give to the world my my more my lightness and my joy and my worry not worrying, yeah. So in Bali that's not difficult to do, but still you know I'm kind of spreading that out, yeah. Okay, that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mm, uh, Bella is saying that she's completely in love with the voice of that uh, guy that uh, that sings in Aramaic. So yeah, in case you maybe, haven't heard, maybe share, uh, maybe share for everyone who, who who wants to look. Yeah, his name is Ori, and then Anna is the the, the second name, so O R I, and then A N A. And he, if you look him up on Facebook, and you see all the mm. the five times a day that he's offering that. And actually at 10 o'clock in the evening, he's doing a, a meditation. Mm -hmm. So he's offering six times a day with guided meditation and with explaining what the words, the Aramaic words mean. And then at seven in the morning, he's doing the chant. And the other times you are, you know, he's just speaking them, the prayers. But every time he's, he's doing something different. Yeah, so if you would just put it there on the Facebook page so we can actually... Okay. See and get the link, yeah. and, you know. Also yeah. for those who, are but it's yeah, can I, I just, shared it on my page, but um, yeah, I can do that. Yes, okay. Can I just say how weird that is? I just, I mean, I found this person. I don't know how on Facebook, literally last week, and I'm just really obsessed with the with the chance because it's it's so powerful, like the way he sings it, and the, also the the meaning of the words, of course. And it's funny because I've been searching for someone who speaks Aramaic for like years because it just appeared to me that I, I need to learn the language for some reason. So, I mean, obviously no coincidence is there, but it's just incredible. <laughs> and I hear the same um, uh, background in your, in, you know, in, in Bali that you have as with him, right? Because of the the, the chicken singing. <laughs> so, yeah, the roosters. Mm -hmm. And for me, oh, he yeah. was also a great teacher because he's fully tattooed. Only his face is not, and I hate tattoos. And at one point I met him and I started to, to ask him about this instead of being judgmental and pushing him away. We had a, a, a great talk about it. And he seemed to be, you know, one of the first people making, setting tattoos in Holland. And he was telling about all the, uh, you know, the tribes and where the tattoos came from. And actually it was so interesting that I said, you know, I still don't like them, but I honor, or it's beautiful how you explain it all. So he, he's, he's a big teacher so far for me <laughs> in several ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's beautiful. Yeah. To, to really make a mind shift all the time and being open and, and yeah. Well, <clears throat> that's our topic going beyond mm -hmm. the, uh, the idea set in stone. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> mm. Wonderful. So we have Luca. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm on the move today, so uh, I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> um, I have been thinking about this topic uh, many times, and uh, every time I uh, every time I think about it, it's a it's a challenge because I find uh, it's uh, a real art um, to find this balance between what we want and what we can do so many times like uh, for example now it's really very strongly uh, exhibited in the world many times we cannot do what we feel our uh, mission or uh, or you know like our song to sing is uh, but we can do other things at those moments so i think uh, it's very helpful to to always um, shift between between uh, this idea ideal of uh, what we want from life and how we want life to be and on the other on the other side uh, these uh, possibilities that uh, are offered for us in this moment because we can only choose from that what is on the table no <laughs> so what does what does it bring for me if I'm if I'm uh, dreaming about uh, coconuts, if there are none on the table. Huh? So, <laughs> here we are. Look, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, it's uh, an important um, 
part of this uh, of this contemplation, mm -hmm. for me at least. Absolutely, yes. thank you. You're mm -hmm. touching a very important uh, topic, and we will definitely go into that. Uh, just to kind of give a little bit of a, a spice there, are we suffering when we are offering less than that full voice? That's uh, where we are going to touch. And how to not have to suffer, that's actually where, where it is, the, the depth of the wisdom. So thank you for opening it up, Luca. Exactly, that's very important aspect of it. In the world today, it's amplified even more with the magnifying glass. So it's easier to see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So... Uh -huh. and Topaz has something to share. Yeah, just to add, hi uh -huh. everyone. Hi. So yeah, I open the email and when I see the topic, I say, oh my, it's spot on. Because <laughs> this is, I'm dealing like, Bella say, it's a, oh, what we gonna say for, like talk for two hours. I'm digging maybe 10 years, I'm still not there, yeah. <laughs> because my topic is in my face and I still don't know where am I and what is my authentic self I think I have been everything but that <laughs> digging 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 thinking like oh yeah I'm there and then again it's another alter ego it's another implant it's another something else and um, that resonates also for me that um, when I was a kid, I also was quite uh, too loud, uh, singing everywhere, being too much everywhere. So I think I also learned to hide myself. How to just not be yourself. Yeah, how to just not be yourself. Uh, how to be just, I know. Myself, that's the part mm -hmm. I'm learning. Yeah. So excited to find more. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. So it seems to be the active topic for so many of us, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so shall we shall we dive right in <clears throat> into we'll start with examining a little bit suffering because this is what is in a, in a trailer of uh, in the trail of last week's resurrection, you know, uh, <clears throat> the whole uh, church philosophy is built upon the suffering, you know, which is supposed to make everyone else feel guilty because, you know, someone suffered for you. So let's see what suffering really means in our lives and to what extent, because we have several layers and several degrees of suffering in the world. And of course, uh, we would rather avoid all of them, but is it possible? And actually, it's very important to look even uh, linguistically in that word suffering, because uh, as we noticed in English, there is no <clears throat> distinction between what is the suffering uh, as we perceive it and what is like being tortured, like, for example, the animal that has been hit by the car, who is in anguish. So in a way, anguish and suffering are not as clearly separated as in some other languages. It's very clear in Slavic languages, in, in Russian, in Serbian, in Latvian, it's very, there are two different words that represent, one represents anguish that we feel, and another represents suffering more as our reaction to the anguish, our reaction to the pain. And it's much more clear to talk about this topic in another language than English, because then it's clear that suffering is our reaction to the state of pain. Or unpleasantness. Mm. To, to, to the extent that you can take uh, suffering as a reaction to physical pain mm -hmm. but uh, it's it can also be a reaction to your own thoughts mm -hmm. yeah so in serbian it would be uh, anguish would be muka and uh, suffering would be patnya so 
something similar in, in, in Russian as well. So that patnya is something that ha happens in our heart as a reaction to the outside circumstance. And it's important that this is how we're going to look at suffering because all the suffering is something that we have chosen as a reaction to what is real in this moment. And best example is our Pepe Danza, this beautiful uh, uh, Shakuhachi musician slash Zen, Zen uh, sage who had broken his wrist and he is a flute player. And percussionist. And percussionist. So you can imagine how handicapping that could be. So he had to go to the doctor to actually pull that most painful thing in order to replace it. And uh, his perspective was amazing, looking at the pain and observing it and not asking those additional questions that cause suffering. Why me? Why my hand? Why my life has I'm... stopped? I can never uh, play mm -hmm. uh, drums again, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so he was able for the most part to feel to feel the unpleasant situation of course it's unpleasant but without asking the additional questions he was in the position to observe the phenomenon of pain and so not to actually suffer but to be in the moment of it and even laugh with the doctors and uh, come out from this you know, with, with least possible inner suffering. So that's an illustration of what those words are. Mm -hmm. So suffering is the meaning, as exactly as Lucas said, our interpretation of the situation uh, where the world goes out of our control <clears throat> and that causes the suffering. Uh, I love how Sadhguru explains that suffering is exclusively of our own making. And if the whole world is in suffering, it means that, you know, things have gone terribly wrong uh, on all levels of uh, everybody's perceptions, because actually, um, and he, he's right to point out that very little physical things happen to us, you know, it, it's not like somebody would be poking you every day with a, with a sword, or you could die at any corner because someone shoots at you like in Wild West. It's very rare that you actually encounter some real physical pain and and would suffer from that yet people are suffering from their own uh in acceptance of how things are and their own unfulfilled dreams and of course attachments so most of the suffering is purely of our of our own making and interpretation of life as as we know so what to do, what to do, uh, and this is the big Buddhist question, right? So we have a couple of people here who, <laughs> who know all about it, but uh, in, in short, in very short, so the whole Buddhist philosophy stands on, on the four pillars of that, okay, life comes with suffering, that's included in a package, you cannot really avoid it, uh, it's there, it's given uh, to us together with uh, our life. But uh, the pillar number two is that we know where it comes from. We have identified that the suffering is always coming hand in hand with attachment. Attachment of how you think things should be, attachment to uh, your own being or personality, you know, all kind of attachment at any level. The pillar number three is that, but there's a solution. So that's a good news in a way. And the pillar number four is- What is the solution? Here are the solutions of Eightfold Path and uh, you know the whole philosophy uh, follows that. So when we actually dwell on it a little bit and understand that suffering is inbuilt in our psyche and the way we perceive the world, then it kind of makes it easier to take a little control over it and to make it really of a choice. When things don't go the way we want them, we still have this moment where we can choose, do we accept it or do we rebel against it? 
and how to which extent we find that it's unjust. You know, even in this little screen, uh, well, we have Karin who, who is confronted with a little bit dramatic situation in her life. So she can make it, uh, she can take facts. Well, this is a fact, this is what's happening to me. Or she can make a whole drama out of it. And well, take all it of to us pretty much the biggest right in that extent situation. of suffering. But you know, uh, Karin actually has a physical uh, fact that is happening to her right now. So it's uh, it's almost like she cannot escape uh, the, the decision. With. Am I going to suffer from this condition or am I going to just constructively go and do and follow and deal? But many of us don't have any particular event that would force suffering, but we can suffer from our own thoughts about future or memories of the past, how he hurt me, how those people said that to me, how uh, I will feel if I have no money, how I will feel I'll get vaccinated and disconnected from my soul, you know, uh, how I cannot travel. Many people actually suffer from uh, inability to travel, like physically, like we can't go anywhere. Cool. And it causes a suffering because of this idea of what you cannot have something that you, you used to be able to, to do freely. Let's call it perception of inability to travel mm -hmm. because it's just the perception. Well, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, mm -hmm. we, we have our own perception because, you know, we somehow manage, yeah, but, uh, but uh, other people are really for not only the, the COVID reasons, but lack of money, engagement, family engagement, whatever situation, lo lockdowns, mm -hmm contribute to, to creating this uh, suffering of not being able to do what you would love to do most. Yeah. And the extent to which you suffer is not proportionate necessarily to the physical drama going on. Let's say having a, a serious illness would sort of provide you with a reason to have a big suffering attached to it. But sometimes my boyfriend, uh, you know, broke up with me can be a bigger suffering than, uh, than a huge illness coming uh, someone's way. So the amplification of, uh, of how wrong is the thing happening to a person is the intensity of suffering. And when we know that it is like we're built to, to, to experience that injustice, inner injustice, but that also, if we are making it, then we can unmake it. Well, that's a big deal to, uh, to recover as an inner power, yeah? And at any given moment when this suffering creeps in and the feeling of injustice or, or, or terror, you know, lurking around the corner, what will happen tomorrow or how this and that is not going my way, well, this anytime you can just say, okay, stop it. Stop it. I see you. I see how am I trying to make suffering out of my own ideas. Yeah. And well, when in this group, we're not in the basic ideas of your suffering because you are not having uh, your favorite toy available. Uh, you know, we're past those basic attachments. So you all mentioned at all points letting go, uh, accepting things as they are, you know, being in peace with our bodies, with our this and our that. So that's a very good start. But then being in peace with the world in general, with what's going on and accepting it just as it is, including the wars, misery, um, all sorts of social injustices, uh, global control coming on upon us, uh, uh, children's abuse, animal, uh, whatever. So that's a lot to deal with. If we manage to deal with our personal perception of what concerns our lives, then we have the next level of uh, uh, su human suffering when we see other people suffer from what we perceive is unjust, but again, in our perception with having a very limited perspective uh, of, you know, what's the highest reason behind all that, yeah? So 
when we deal with a personal suffering because we have kind of understood that it's attachments and we're starting to slowly ease up on our personal attachments to how we should look how we should be what's our you know how our career should have been that is the easy one the hard one is finding the sense about suffering in the world especially when we're hugely empathic yeah and compassionate because from one side we hear yeah open your heart be compassionate you know uh, pray for the world pray for the peace uh, we have heard this and been invited to to kind of do something about the suffering in the world by offering our love or light or chants or prayers um, etc uh, the buddhist branches that pray exclusively for the end of suffering in the world so we have to be very very careful in this part of the journey like how much rights do we have to act upon somebody else's suffering very 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 careful in that so it's everybody's individual question how responsible am i for somebody else's suffering or how responsible am i for easing somebody else's suffering it's a huge question of morals that cannot be answered in a snap of uh, the fingers, but it's, it's a very, very important uh, point to dwell in and not to come up with some very like automatic uh, reaction, which would be if you have a answer on the tip of your fingertips, it's, it might it's be a condition you, answer. You haven't thought about it deep enough. You know, yeah. it's a conditioned answer from being a good citizen or good person or good, uh, good friend. Uh, you know, we as human beings are built genuinely as a kind and compassionate uh, creatures. You know, we really do care. Most of us do care about other people's sufferings. And whenever we have a chance or choice, we would rather go and, you know, help, help fight injustice in the world. But when you take that concept of help fight the injustice in the world, that's where you have to be very, very, very careful. And wind it down to what's the real and actual motivation behind. And how much do you have the global perspective mm -hmm. of, of yeah. a reason of things happening mm -hmm. so that you can yeah. with full authority say, yes, I need to stop this suffering in this form. So the you big know? question is, uh, are we by doing that actually robbing somebody of the experience that they needed to go through because uh, the previous levels of uncomfort discomfort were not enough to actually get them past the hurdle to actually start to uh, raise up in consciousness or whatever needs to happen on their life's path so are we trying to rob them from the original experience that they need to go through? That is always that question. Mm -hmm. If we are... Uh, How much a perspective we mm -hmm. have on things mm -hmm. to be able to decide anything for anyone mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And given that, you know, it's a strange question. Why would uh, human beings that have pretty fragile nervous system and are kind and compassionate at the core. So why would we be given this uh, suffering that tags along uh, in our lives well because strange enough there's nothing that moves us more than the dread of suffering or uh, like unwanting to suffer so it's an evolutionary force that comes through us and uh, once we realize how to navigate and take the suffering as a driving force as an evolutionary force well we consider it a force as anything else we don't we stop giving it so much importance we stop avoiding it and we are being you know kind of normal calm and constructive about it so avoiding suffering altogether um that's what we would like to do but that is eventually not the best thing to do because avoiding suffering is avoiding uh those lessons or our personal set of goals that are trying to come 
through us in form of events that are unpleasant. So, so it other, has to make us react. In other words, if there wasn't some sort of limitation in our perception of things or in our equanimity, we wouldn't feel it as suffering. We would feel it as, oh yeah, I see what the point is. So I will just open myself wider. But if it comes to the suffering, then it means, oh, but my resistance is so big that I had to, to suffer. And the best example of that are those experiences of uh, death and rebirth in our uh, spiritual journey. We, when we are in, in that given situation to actually die, to be born in the, on the next level of consciousness, we are really experiencing that we are about to die. And we are like, you know, struggling and, and, and trying to push it away. We don't want, we don't want. But then when it does happen, then after that, the amazing new level opens up. So that program to avoid that is under underscoring all of it because we have been kind of brainwashed into not knowing that, uh, you know, that in, in this incarnation is just opening the next one. So, and this is what is holding us in the cage all the time. It's like uh, that fear and, and, and not being able to accept it and understand that we are going higher on that elevator that we mentioned last time when we go through that experience. So through, through, throughout the next uh, you know, month, we'll be dwelling a lot <clears throat> in the concept of death and dying because this is, this is literally what, uh, hi Claudia, <laughs> this is literally a, a huge hindrance because the mystery or the ambience that has been created around death and suffering that has been attached to it, although we have no idea, is it a suffering? Uh, that's a huge obstacle in, um, mm -hmm. in, you know, on our way to, to real freedom. So we'll be talking about a lot, but imagine that if we would just be able to accept our own death and death of the ones we care about in full normality, in full, like it's a fact, you know, you, you have no control about your or somebody else's uh, life or death, but it creates a huge amount of suffering, anything, even projecting that, that your child might die, you know, it already creates suffering, just touching it with a thought. Nobody wants it, nobody, and it's so painful that, that you wouldn't even want to look at it because you think that somehow even imagining the death of your own child would be kind of calling it in. And there's lots of superstition and um, a gray zones around the death of loved one. How do you put it in the context of your own life? What does it mean to you? Uh, for example, Hannah went through the death of her, her father. So she had to place it, want it or not, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's happening. So she has to place it in the context and, uh, you know, more or less consciously wiggle out of uh, the fact that has been presented to her, uh, having, a, you know, a close one with a terminal illness where you know that the end is near, but you don't know when exactly. So the suffering is all this commotion around the inevitable fact of death, our own mm -hmm. or loved ones. And connected with that ignorance about the whole process and actually what it represents and what it is. So a lack of first-hand experience about it. And there's something to be done about it. It's not that we cannot uh, explore that area. We can. But this ties actually very importantly to our today's topic because yeah. this is at the core of the question of uh, just being ourselves and what happens if uh, we are in the situation like Luca says that we cannot uh, fully express what it is, but we can partially express it. Mm -hmm. So what happens there? That is uh, what it ties to this topic very much. So let's take a step back and uh, remember those times that we were only the conditioned beings, you know, when we were perfect sum of our parents overlays, 18 frames of mind, everything we have ever talked about that we are condensed social uh, beings and we have no idea of who we are, yeah? So we have all been that uh, at some point and, you know, most of the planet is still that. 
a pack package of uh, social conditioning without too much of uh, existential questions. So at that level of, uh, of fully entangled with uh, beliefs and social norms uh, state, suffering is inevitable. It is a fact because there's no space for uh, like looking from above or introspection or uh, you know understanding things it's a full-on experience and usually things always go wrong from that perspective where you live as a as a sum of your beliefs things are supposed to go wrong because they're supposed to hit you out of that state and and liberate you to your authentic self so the suffering is almost constant we would call it's a hundred percent suffering to live like that because nothing goes the way you want People don't do what you want them to do. Uh, the government doesn't do what you want them to do. Uh, your body doesn't look the way you want it to look. So at every level, everything is, is wrong and everything can go wrong at any moment. Yeah. So that's, that's where the maximum of suffering is. And actually why we're doing all this spiritual work and um, you know, shedding the layers and untruth about ourselves because we think and you know we're pretty sure that by shedding the untruths of who we are we will come into who we really are and that's you know if not end of all suffering at least it's end of active suffering active fighting against the world so that's these couple of sharings that we had where you guys asked okay so let me feel who i really am when am i uh, acting out of my limitations and what is my true voice it is still going up towards the place where you at least know who your authentic self is and what your authentic voice is so this is the first part of the journey mm -hmm. it is to liberate ourselves from everything that is filtering uh, our pure connection to the divine so it is you know, what they told me in school that I am, I'm too much. I'm not supposed to uh, express uh, like... Ask questions. <laughs> like Bella and Anna said, don't run too much and don't be so emotional. And uh, whatever was said from the outside, the first part of the journey is really getting those layers shed out so that we know what is our true voice. And this is up to resurrection. This is that first process. These are cyclical pro processes. So as we go through those re uh, uh, resurrections, we are going more and more and more towards the true uh, divine voice that we can have and the true divine incarnation because we are getting wider and wider and more and more energy can go through us. But the first part of the journey is finding the true connection and knowing who we truly are no matter what the outside conditioning is mm -hmm. now we are talking about the second part of the journey we are there already we know what our true voice is so what do we do with that when we are in this world that is on this current level of consciousness can we fully be who we are if we are really the divine voice mm -hmm. so that's what we are examining here and when is it appropriate to fully express ourselves, and when is it maybe appropriate to actually do something else and not be bothered and do it actually on purpose? Mm -hmm. So in this first stage, uh, suffering is actually a necessary element because it's like a fire, uh, you're like a little fire under your butt hmm. that keeps you moving because it's so uncomfortable that you cannot stay stuck how you are. So it's a very good evolutionary drive that the suffering makes you question uh, yourself. So in the second stage, after you have uh, resurrected to your more or less authentic self, I say more or less because- Because we keep doing, you know, we going keep higher and higher. Yeah. <laughs> there are also layers of or deeper authentic and deeper. authenticity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when we are more or less in authentic self, what, what that essentially means is there is a comfortable way of being plus a witness that can observe the situation for you. That's the main difference between one stage of spiritual journey and the, and the next one. 
that there is a witness that can say in your head, okay, stay present, this is happening, uh, not to you, it's happening around you. So check out why, how you're feeling in it, check out how you're interpreting. So your authentic self uh, is aware of itself and aware of the, the situation and can actually extract meaning of what is happening, yeah? Can make some sense out of it and doesn't consider the, the, the whole world is conspiracy against you and your person. So yet there is beyond. So once we reach the stage of our authentic selves and feel that, oh, finally, you know, and uh, I'm happy who I am and where I am, I'm in peace with my body. So just be yourself. Let's look at the just. So is that enough? Mm. Is being yourself enough? Is that the, the peak of the mountain? Is that the platform that we can comfortably sit and dwell on and stay forever? Are we meant to just reach the state of being our authentic selves? Well, in esoteric astrology, it is said, okay, now I have reached the top. Now, compassionately, I go down the mountain to share my findings with my brothers and sisters. So it's really on purpose going back into the mud pit to actually help our, you know, fellow humans also uh, wake up. So that means is now we have to adopt the set of communication skills, so to speak, in order to share in understandable ways our findings when we are on the top of the mountain. Yeah, so now we go down the mountain with that uh, uh, rich connection and we are we are sharing it and sharing it with the world means we cannot really tell them the weird things that would scare them and 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 and, and close them up even more but this is also necessary so that they are like a clam they don't you know shut down and don't receive anything at all so we have to consciously embody the role of communicator or, 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 or let's say uh, a teacher in a way or, or, or just a, a compassionate sharer, how, how, how would we name it? So that we can share those, those clarities with people who are, have not yet been on the top of the mountain. And we know how scary it is to them to tell them, oh, you just die and be reborn. And uh, then and it's, you're, it's going deal. to be clear. And it's, by the way, you're going to be super scared and a guide. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. So in that case, if we are seeing it that way, if we are seeing it that we are going with that clarity and, and, and don't worry what we tell those people is what we are telling them with our words. But what we radiate, we cannot radiate anymore in any lower frequency than the ones that we have reached on the top of the mountain. So actually what they're getting is our frequency, but wrapped into the words that are understanding, understandable to them. So that they are not freaking out about the journey that they are about to do themselves. So when we look at this uh, slogan again, just be yourself. So just be yourself, like that's it. Like, like you, you, you have to be yourself at all times, uh, fully authentic every step of the way. When you go to supermarket, when you are with the parents, when you're with friends, when you're going through customs, like do you have to be just authentic self with no exceptions at all times everywhere? So that is the question that that is your own individual. Well, we have a suggestion for that, but um, as um, as you just said, just being yourself, fully authentic at all times, and have being attached 
to the way that of, just. of mm -hmm. being that is the next level of attachment. Next level of suffering. Yeah. Next because level of suffering. I am less than who I am and this is threatening my identity. Yeah. Once that we are... You're suffering because the whole world is not embracing your newly baked authentic self. Uh, so how come? Oh my God, guys, you know, uh, upgrade the world quickly <laughs> because I am here. So I am not going to change myself or diminish myself now that I'm authentic. So bring me the world where I can exist without having to compromise in any ways. It is a big trap. I really would like to bring everybody's attention to these traps that we set to ourselves and this obligation of being having to be authentic. Yeah, with a- In a supermarket. In a supermarket with <laughs> customs officer, with a lady who tells you to pull your mask on the, on the nose. So whatever is irritating and, and kind of, uh, poking your real self. No, but this is my belief. So I will do how I please at any, at any situation. Um, well, it's not very helpful because it's the ne next level of attachment to your authentic self. Mm -hmm. it's... Before, before <laughs> it was attachment to your unreal self and now it's attachment to your authentic self. And the suffering comes because the world doesn't meet you where you are. And of course it doesn't because it, it has the work to do to get there. But if we struggle with the fact that the world has a work to do, then, you know, we're not aware of the situation because the humanity does have some work to do to raise itself up to the uh, level of more consciousness. Let's call it at least that, yeah. that we can probably all agree on. So the suffering in this level of being authentic self is that everybody else is asleep and there are categories of, of spiritual and non-spiritual people awake and asleep, uh, uh, sheep and the ones who see above. So it's another, you know, it's another set of illusion that Separations. opens up mm -hmm. if we just want to be our authentic selves at all times. And this is, this is a slippery mm -hmm. uh, slope in spiritual journey where we trade one kind of attachment for another mm -hmm. kind of attachment, so which is it, essentially the same and if, creates the same suffering. Exactly. So if we take out the word just and we are just your, ourselves, we can understand that we cannot actually be anything else but ourselves. There is no even a possibility to be anything else. We are always ourselves and we are always the highest part of ourselves that we have reached and how we share from that point is really our choice like the divine part of ourselves is never coming any layers lower than we have reached already so it's almost like we have been to that highest or deepest level that we have reached we saved the video game there and then we will continue to play and go even deeper in the next session also also but there is nothing else that we can be but ourselves anyway if we remove that word just mm -hmm. the only thing uh, where, where the problem comes is when we put too much of importance of mm -hmm. exhibiting and claiming and stating and asserting our authentic selves by all means mm -hmm. so which brings us to the second layer of seeing just be yourself so is it time for the drawing yeah, or not yet? Um, yeah, right after this. So just be yourself. So Bella said being versus kind of doing or, or pushing or everything. Just be yourself. Well, um, yes, I think it's a good idea to, to be yourself. And when you are giving that being space, when you are being uh, you really change reality by by just that yeah by being yourself and it's a good idea to uh, be yourself at all times within yourself but do you always have to be yourself when you interact with the world are you compromising your authenticity by you know creating another extra personality for convenience of uh, going on about your daily things in the world. It's actually, I like this uh, analogy 
are you really compromising yourself by giving your medicine in small doses so that it doesn't poison the patient? You know, we are able to take maybe, uh, uh, let's say, a glass of poison because this is how far we have stretched ourselves. But the person with whom we are sharing can maybe just take one spoonful mm -hmm. and that's enough. And this is exactly how the medicine is given. At their level now, they get one spoonful. As they go higher and higher, they can be getting more and more. Mm -hmm. So is this really compromising our truth yeah. or not? If we are giving it in full spoonfuls rather than full picture at the same time. And isn't it actually the act of compassion to not blind someone with our light uh, who is not ready? Isn't it act of compassion to meet them where they are and to because we are not compromising ourselves inside. So is it really not act of compassion to create an intermediate uh, alter ego of ourselves that can interact lovingly and meet other people wherever they are in the world? There is a, uh, there is a profound truth of uh, how energy works in, in the world and um, the, the Russian uh, kind of guru that uh, that puts it in very uh, understandable perspective is saying when you are giving too much of uh, of a stretch for someone uh, and you're hitting them out of uh, their ways of being first of all they'll cut you off second of all you will suffer some energetic consequences for imposing something to someone that they're not ready to integrate so dosing yourself, your point of view, your authenticity, your, your everything is the key here. And if you feel that it would compromise your way of being authentic, uh, if you act less than you would with yourself or with like-minded, well, then there is still some ego remains that uh, need to claim that no, I am this, no matter what, at all times. Mm -hmm. So that's where we want to, to, to draw huge attention because somehow it's promoted in spiritual circles that you should not compromise anything. You should be yourself at all times everywhere and never compromise mm -hmm. any bit of it. But let, let <laughs> us remind that most of uh, really powerful spiritual movements, alchemical movements and so forth, has, have always been underground. They were never publicly sharing where they are and they had always kept the power of that uh, wisdom for the carefully selected group who is not uh, prone to uh, misusing it. Yeah, so those deepest revelations were actually not available publicly because they would probably throw people off uh, and this is something that we can adopt for you know where we are because we are getting on to the levels that could be really dangerous for general public to have it on their current state of awareness yeah so there are chances that at the, the state the world is right now your real self will be clashing with other people's realities and that's where actually you're inflicting suffering to those who are not ready to you know open so much of a of a space within themselves and inflict suffering to you who is basically well pearls between swines this is the situation and it's even written in the bible that you have to carefully choose where and how you give that um, authentic light that, that you have. And uh, for, for e. Eve Hansra, who is into jinkies, there's a whole jinky about that. I, by the way, I have it. It's a discernment. It's a discernment of where you can be your full-blown authentic self, where you have to be a version of it, and where you have to be, you know, just like everyone else, except that at this stage of the journey, you are the one who creates it. You are the one who, who does it on, on purpose, who can modify your like uh, original potency to something less because you decide that the situation is, um, you know, appropriate that way. 
So we have a little drawing. Uh, it's not it's not very pretty, but uh, it's. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> but just to help you illustrate mm -hmm. how how it looks. Can you see it? So let's see. Here's the beginning of uh, of uh, of the journey. Yeah? This first phase of ourselves, which is the social self. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that social self, well, we put hundred percent suffering because it's suffering from bad weather, from. Uh, what other people, what neighbors said, uh, who looked at me like that, my girlfriend stabbed me in the back. Uh, so prisoner of their own ideas of the world and uh, chained to unmovable concepts of uh, what's just uh, in the world. So 100% suffering there. And this is what is this drive to, to get out of, um, out of this conditioned misery. So now I hope we have passed that. So now we jump to our authentic self, yeah. where technically we're in peace with the way, the way the world is. And we're in peace when we are by ourselves, in our caves, in our uh, beautifully crafted, sacred uh, spaces, apartments, uh, when nobody asks anything, sun is shining, we're shining, we're loving the whole world until we hear the news. So this is a beautiful space to be. And then there's such thing as the world. So below the line, below so the line, there's a little move. ladder mm -hmm. and you undiluted beautiful self, authentic self goes into the world. Uh, I'm thinking of Lisa goes in the world where she will laugh so much when she watches this. well well where people yeah hey lisa by the way so you see you're going undiluted like a bright sun in the midnight and shining in <clears throat> the market in the institutions uh, immigration offices and all those beautiful places and encountering people's well narrow-mindedness yeah straight uh, forward narrow mindedness and this incompatibility of uh, you not being seen for who you really are that's a big big new age cliche nobody sees me for who i am that creates even more suffering when it was just your what neighbors will think about you and how your boyfriend left you so this this incompatibility of uh, how you want to live with how the world is, is creating even more suffering at a deeper level because it doesn't really have solutions uh, that far. And that comes from attachment to having to be authentic self at all times, yeah? So there is a solution how to get out of that 500% suffering and to detach from the need to be authentic everywhere at all times. And here is what, what we call a mastery. Mastery would be when you become a script writer before you were unconscious actor. Now you, you realize you're writing so, the script. So before you had these uh inner aspects and alter egos unconsciously drive, driving your life. Mm -hmm. Wildly expressing themselves at all times when it's yeah. inappropriate. So once that we have gotten rid of them, then we understand that actually those identities are almost like a mask or like, yeah, like a stage suit, stage mask for the given roles that we want to play in the world how it is now and we consciously put them on per need mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we and you're worked. the one creating them exactly a full full spectrum personality mm -hmm. that that has a function so that if you are a writer or actually in hannah's uh case if you are a musician well then you have a stage uh costume as a musician in the world with which you name. play 
it has a name. So we worked about on avatars the other the other day about our project. It's literally adopting the avatars that you will embody this time consciously for certain types of sharings with the world in the stage at which it is right now. And hopefully this authentic self will be able to express itself fully among certain people, hopefully as in on the forums like we are on and now, where we can really fully be ourselves and say, oh, well, at least we have someone with whom to play in our full authentic self. And then with the rest of the world, we have uh, our stage suits to put on and we don't suffer for that. Mm -hmm. We are deciding to do it. It's almost like it's, uh, it's an interpreter between us and the world as it is right now or an interface. Yeah, we, we had funny moments. Can I share yeah. your, uh, the, the story with Milk? Uh, sure, I don't even know what it is, so I'll also be surprised. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, I, I'll just share one funny example how your authentic self can, can really not match the situation. So ah, yes, we're, yes, si yes. we're sitting in the airport <laughs> 5 a.m. And yeah, that's uh, true. all we want is, you know, a porridge, a porridge that not- In England, yeah, in it England, was yeah. in London. Uh, we, without uh, you know without the dairy milk it was very early yeah with, i'm with still in milk. my full authentic self <laughs> so vittorio's authentic self wants a porridge with um, an almond milk for example so the waitress comes and and says so so uh with milk and he says uh, no not the cow's milk and she says uh, are you allergic to milk no i'm not allergic but uh, but i don't like it well, sir, are you allergic or not to, to, to the milk? No, but I'm against the idea of torturing the cows and uh, this whole <laughs> thing is, uh, I'm not allergic, but I And am stop against. asking me the questions, <laughs> just bring me what she I'm says, asking. Sir, are you allergic or not? I need to know. <laughs> uh, no, but then, then leave the porridge. I don't want it anymore anyways. So a whole full drama, 5 a.m. in the airport because the authentic self wants to explain the whole philosophy behind not wanting the milk to the lady who, who has a script to fill uh, so that the client doesn't die on her table from like allergy. Because... And who, by the way, is helpful, you know, like she's doing it out of her inner goodness. She's just following the script, but that's all she knows. So, so in, that, in that moment, it's very helpful to have like a, a little avatar that interacts with people and doesn't like flood them with global philosophies at all times. But, you know, just answers questions, yes or no. And if there's opening, then, you know, gives some more. So it, it, can, it can really make things easier or sometimes your authentic self kills the opportunity of, uh, of any upgrade for, <laughs> for a person because it ends up in com in ununderstandable clash. So um, it's that's the purpose of creating these social avatars. And I would really invite you, it's a fun thing to do. We did it for, uh, for our purposes, like the client's avatar. Well, you have a little form to fill and, uh, and Uwe can guide you to uh, where, where to find that uh, form. You can literally create a little Google Doc of your social avatar that would be for um, interacting with, uh, I don't know, service providers. Uh, you can create an avatar which would talk to other parents at school. You know, for example, in French school, I have to be a normal mom. You know, I can't embarrass my my kids by <laughs> by being. <laughs> being something very extravagant so you know then i my daughters even say okay dress like a mom please yeah so i literally dress like a mom and i perform i ask very like logical mom's questions to, to the teachers in the parents meetings and nobody would suspect you know what's what's behind that and i have no problem with it because i know that as much as i have a close set for certain opportunities there's no need to to create that much of awakening in a school and, and for my children who are not ready for that, it's, it's just not serving the purpose. So that's where the discernment comes in. And, you know, this 
intermediate persona that I control this time. It doesn't control me. I control it. Yeah. And that's the big difference. Uh, that's the big difference whether the alter egos that have been created without your knowledge are driving you or you have created alter egos that serve uh, the purpose of doing things for you in a manner to, you know, just keep traveling and, and walking. Uh, Eve had a question, I think, when you were mentioning uh, uh, our children. No, what, what it is, I, I, I totally resonate with this topic, um, with this need to be my authentic self <laughs> sometimes <laughs> and, come, and come across like a complete lunatic to just about, you know, especially my like family in-laws, that kind of thing. Um, and when I, you know, and like when I'm reading like Facebook and I'm like, oh, I need to say something here. And I tend to get this very kind of physical experience. It's almost, uh, it's like an, it's like a bodily sensation. It's like a, it's like a, like a really, I don't know how to describe it. Like it's like a frequency, like a shift in my physical. And sometimes I, I think I've asked you this before. Sometimes it's like, I want, it's like, oh, I should speak. You know, actually, this is me being asked to speak. But I'm wondering, listening to you, that maybe it's my indication of just to not speak. You know, like that's my body saying that this isn't like, I don't know. Like, I don't know whether you can help me yeah. work out because I've had so many questions about what is this? It's like a cold sweat or and I'm like, should I be standing up or should I be actually this is my indication to yeah, just stand back very slowly and maybe not say a word. <laughs> So it's a great question, Eve. It's really uh, asking all of us, you and all of us, to see what is real motivation for your speech. Mm. If real motivation is to assert yourself because you feel that you cannot express yourself, that means that you are first, still in the first phase towards getting to that authentic self. And you are rebelling from, you know, uh, against the conditions that didn't allow you to be there in the first place and the it, parents that was uh, school that it, was everything else it's more like it's more like you know when someone's driving over and they're about to reach a cliff top and you're like no pull back it's more of that feeling it's like i can see that they have got it they're so that's not the way they need to see that you know and it's and, and it's but it's what you're saying is that they need to kind of fall off the cliff you know and oh, it's like yeah. not putting Many myself yeah you know so, it's more that feeling it's like you know don't do that because i know what that i know where that path goes because i've lived it did you listen when your parents told you that no in the first place you didn't did you grow wiser from have uh, falling off the cliff from yourself? burning yourself you many did. Times. i wish i'd listened i mean like in no. an actual <laughs> I, I i do you know what i've realized about that this whole that thing for me personally it's about building trust and i think that's where it comes down to relationships you know and if you build a level of trust with someone and you can be a voice to that person and they can take you because they know that you love them and yeah so for me it was like it was a lack of trust with my parents more than anything which we didn't have that you know anyway but that's a different topic altogether but i hear your point so yeah the second exactly. part of the answer to the question what is the motivation to speak is also are you being asked to share that's the bit i don't know Exactly. And that's actually people are ready to hear something only if they have asked for the input. That means that they're open to receive it. If they get it, you know, like uh, shoutingly and with, uh, you know, out of your experience, it might mean that they have to burn themselves first in order to kind of get more of this urge to, uh, to, to, to go on with their journey. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it has been the big drama of my life because I have a strange capacity of seeing scenarios down the line and, you know, for, for everything, for the children, if they do this, what mm -hmm. will happen exactly in three hours or three months? And I'm trying to kind of with huge energy to convince them to, to change before it goes down the line, which I know what it will. And, and they don't. So then I understood well, it's not my place to rob them of experience, of course, but also it's my place to kind of, if I'm asked to voice it out, 
it's there. They take it or they don't, but also to go at the end of the pit where they will fall and scrape them back from the floor and you know, <laughs> hug and, uh, and put the plaster. So that's what we do. With children, it's also a little different because you don't wait for them to ask always because uh, with your children, you are actually in charge of their journey up till when they are uh, adults. So up till they are 18, 16 or 18 years of age. So you might steer them into the right direction because with children, it's different than with just anybody in the world. But with others, it's they have asked and only if they asked. If not, that means they will have to go harder way. They're not ready for the shortcut. Mm -hmm. and, and in general, uh, let's make peace with those mistakes that people make that they could have not made, you know, the wasted time, wasted opportunities. Let's make peace with the way things unfold, because if they can go much more faster and straightforward in my head, it doesn't mean it's the speed of everyone. So always let's make distinction of uh, how it would be if we did it and how it is if uh, the other people do it. Mm -hmm. And when you feel this urge to, mm -hmm. urge to speak, well, first of all, check if it's, uh, if it's appropriate uh, moment, but also the way how you speak. That can, that can change a lot. Uh, for example, we love uh, Stanislav Grof. And if you have a chance to listen to his uh, interviews, it's a pure pleasure to just listen to this man who is dressed in all right. appropriate, yep, right. he's dressed in appropriate, uh, you know, kind of psychiatrist, uh, researcher suit. Uh, he's speaking in a very kind of uh, beautiful voice, uh, uh, putting ideas in absolutely clear ways and bringing on the table all the philosophy about psychedelics but in a way that no one's ideas can be heard. Not diminishing, but saying what he has to say for those who have ears to hear while wrapping it in a context that's, that cannot be you know, denied or questioned. And he has only made it so far because of this ability to chameleonize and to put the core information in a shell, you know, like a bitter pill sugar coated. Well, it's not uh, being fake if you, sugarcoat a bitter pill it's just that's the real compassion to understand that you know sometimes mm -hmm. straightforward things they just don't serve the purpose they yeah. miss the, the, well, the opportunity Sadhguru is doing the similar thing he is wrapping really deep philosophy in easy swallowable bites so that per, you know like a person of an from an average level can engage in a journey so they are not scared by where they are going and they're held through that the right approach so both of those guys are a great example how uh, how this can be done uh thank you Miriam. Yeah. and uh, bella yes <laughs> yeah i just had a, uh, because you started saying that uh you know when you ask yourself what's the real motivation mm -hmm. you said about the, if you're asserting yourself it's phase one but i don't think you finished what's like, how do you know if you're in phase two? What's the if you are yeah, asserting that part didn't yourself, take this is the phase one. Phase two is, are you genuinely being asked to contribute your opinion? And, uh, and in addition to that, back? if you then still are you ready to give slowly a one uh, spoonful and then observe the reaction of a person whether they're ready for another spoonful or it's enough for this session, you know, because they can be poisoned by the amount of light. They can be blinded by the light or they can be poisoned by what's not poison for you, but is for them. Perfect. And, and, and then can I just ask one more question? So I, I know you said that when you share and, you know, people are not ready for it, then you shouldn't share. But what if it's someone close to you and their decisions are affecting your life as well in very direct ways like what is yeah. what is what is the bella, situation we'll that talk way? about that after <laughs> the session bella hello uh there is no other 
Okay, got you. <laughs> I'm that too, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Thanks, that, brings, that brings us to the third interpretation of just be yourself just be your self yeah there is no other there is just yourself and there has always been just yourself so all interpretation that brings suffering is your own confusion within your own being there is no world that creates suffering. There is no partner that squeezes you in the corner. There is no parents that uh, disagree with who you are. It's just you being confused about yourself and this inner structure, uh, how you express yourself in the world. Let's say when we attach uh, so much importance to our authenticity at all times. Well, the partner who is not ready for that level of authenticity will uh, go poking, of course. And then you would say, yeah, but if I'm half of that, then I'm pretending that I'm being fake. No, not necessarily. You are not being fake. If you can on purpose create an interface, an alter ego that serves the purpose of raising the child, with a person that's less compatible than you would wish it to be. But you are comfortably giving that side of yourself, yeah, that facet of yourself, that expression of yourself to the situation, yeah, and, and see if that brings peace. You have another alter ego that interacts with parents, like uh, Zana shared yesterday, she's in the meet the parents situation at the moment, and, and now clearly seeing how those interactions, and they're completely pointless, because no one's getting anywhere. Uh, you can see the beliefs clashing and clashing and clashing, and how to be authentic self there. Well, by creating a special me for parents, alter ego. And having that um, inner core that's shining through, but speaking in a way that they can hear. Because we don't want to kill poor parents with too much of a philosophy. We, we just want to be able to talk to them, yeah? So this is yourself is the only thing there is. So take care of that yourself and uh, you'll be in peace with the world because you'll understand that it's of your own making how you see it every minute of your life yeah and journeying through this uh, elevator that we we keep mentioning is actually bringing your consciousness and i can't wait anna for you to to get uh, your <laughs> your to your study actually if you can share uh, uh also the link to where you are getting those studies it's also very interesting probably for more a lot of people and me personally when we get our uh, out of uh, our own perception of our only ourselves it's liberating so much more space to be in peace with uh with basically anything that comes your way. And uh, that, according to Buddha, is the ultimate way out of suffering. When you don't attach too much importance to anything, but you're being as authentic as you can be at any moment. Saying the right thing, the right thing according to, according to your authentic self, doing the right thing, uh, living the right way and the right way being not the uh, the social right way but the the way that matches this inner conviction that we have and i would just want to mention um, uh, so anna and bella who are afraid to be too loud or disturb people on more Miriam, you know how about shouting uh, chanting alms uh, <laughs> for the neighbors and uh, and being too loud or too emotional. Well, you know that everybody is responsible for their perception. So if your emotions hurt someone's feelings, well, they are hurt basically. It's their thing. <laughs> it's like absolutely not your concern. Yeah. If in that moment you feel that your authentic authenticity is, is more important than 
uh, than preserving um, their peace of mind, you know? I would add one more actually insight there that uh, keeps coming for us. And that's actually, Bella, another part of that answer from where uh, the sharing is coming. There are situations, and Evia knows because it happens for her, there are situations where somehow you feel like this needs to come through me and I need to say no matter what, what uh, consequences. consequences are. And in those situations, you can actually even learn to notice when the frequency of your sharing comes from that space. It is the divine is speaking through me no matter what. And no matter what will happen as a consequence, they must hear it this way. And this is also that happens sometimes. It's like, okay, I have analyzed, it's not my ego trying to assert itself. It is maybe not fully appropriate, uh, but it needs to come out because the yeah. person needs to hear this right now. If you hear it like this, that the divine is speaking through you, well, then we allow divine to speak and we deal with consequences later. Because that person who had had to be kind of hit by that information, maybe really needed that hit in order to to yeah. carry on with the journey. Yeah, it's a, it seems like a very fine line, right? Between where it's your ego asserting and where yeah. you actually have to share it because it's something that's just can't be other way, right? So it's like, a, yeah. I guess you have to, it's really a self gauging and feeling that vibration that absolutely you have to guide yourself right? yeah mm -hmm. it's and, and usually there's a setting for that for example it's unlikely that the waitress uh, with the porridge uh, had to get awakened at 5 a.m to, <laughs> to the cow so it's very unlikely that it was coming through to her at that time but you know, it's more of uh, when we're in the network of people that we are the only ones who can speak to each other at that level. That's where we have to actually allow it. Uh, we can't be too much when we're in the network for each other. Sometimes even in the sharings, I'm saying things and then I, mama mia, uh, whose mind is gonna crush with this information? But then I understand, well, I said it, so it's too late. I cannot kind of retrieve it back and, and it, it does have a purpose. So the setting can indicate you whether it's asserting or actually, you know, someone needs to hear something. Mm. Thank you. That's really powerful information. I need to analyze and process it. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Uh, Claudia, I think you wanted to add something or, or ask. No, okay, okay. <laughs> you are and, chasing uh, flies, okay. <laughs> and Miriam is saying, uh, I think when you're really authentic, you're also in resonance with your environment. Well, uh, I think what's really important is to have that outside self-observation going on, because if we let it be an automatic, that we kind of believe that we are going to be in resonance with the environment, only if you have gotten to that level of mastery that you are super aware that you are. Otherwise, it could be, you know, I'm just not even kind of observing myself, but I hope that I'm in resonance with the environment. It depends. You might or might not be. So that muscle of having the outside observer always on. And always present. After a while becomes moment. your second nature. But for now, you are your own judge to see if you have that outside objective observer on or not yet fully, fully there. So in, in one well, that, that's what I mean, or that, yeah, it sounds maybe a bit strange, but that you're kind of one with, with the environment as yourself. And if you act from there, then there's no, there's no issue because it's egoless. There's no ego involved. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, yes. That, that, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. that's what I feel this morning when Ori was chanting and I asked him later, I said, do you get, do you get response from the neighborhood he said no people are just smiling at me i think well it comes really from his authentic self and it somehow it resonates or um yeah yes exactly because it's really without any ego in that moment yeah you're right Miriam. 
So the environment mm. does respond to our spontaneous, uh, authentic self. The frequency, which is exactly. pure. Exactly. Yeah. But providing, you know, you go through the customs without any questions because you are not, uh, you're not trying to prove anything to anyone. You're just uh, going, right? Yeah. And uh, the flat that you will book, uh, like what we hear, yeah, like completely randomly, and we book uh, the right thing with the right people without trying uh, anything. So the problem, the dissonance comes when you become attached to having to be authentic and, you know, having to do what you feel like doing at every given moment. Attachment creates this polarization. For example, Lisa, if you're watching this, more you're trying to be your uh, authentic self at all times, more the environment is kind of clashing against it's it. It's trying to teach you that you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. So easing up on the need mm -hmm. or attachment to have to be in a certain way is the way to harmony mm -hmm. at, at all levels of existence. Mm -hmm. So those of you who are saying, I, this is what I feel like doing, so that's what I'm going to do. Well, you're creating a huge push back from the environment that will actually challenge that what you want to keep so dearly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So always check if you are not gripping onto your authentic self too much and where you can mm -hmm. loosen it and mm -hmm. you know it comes spontaneously without too much of an assertion yeah yeah luca we, uh, you wanted to share yes i wanted to, to um add one thing i think uh, it depends on the on the level of um of interaction we want to have with our environment so if we want to uh, to go around a lot and meet a lot of people and work with different people and be in a lot of contact, then uh, I think it's uh, very important what you what you stressed many times in this talk today. Um, so to keep to keep playing appropriate roles for for a certain for a certain relations, uh, but if we want to to just you know. Um, live on a on a farm and just do our thing there grow vegetables and need them and or just live in a jungle you know then of course we can uh, we can uh, be our ourself in a way that we do exactly what we want to do at every single moment but mostly most people are not uh, are not ready to to uh, compromise uh, in this way so me for example I don't want to live in a jungle. I want to be in contact with people. So I accept the fact that I have to play a different role uh, in my work and a different role uh, I can play at home. So at home, I can be more myself, but still I can't be uh, my full authentic self uh, when I'm uh, talking to Ana Yulia, for example, because that might mean in certain moments to say something that would hurt her. Like you said, I think it's, I think you you explained it very nicely. It's, uh, I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so exactly, Luca. The, there is one, we can put everything we have said in this past hour, we can put it one simple sentence. It's be yourself and do what's the best. Yeah. So be yourself and do what's the best. Yeah, so it's, it's not, not what I want. It's what, what the right thing is, no? Yeah. So yeah. you're not stuck in your own being, in, in protecting, asserting, controlling yourself or the world. So you don't just be yourself and you don't just be yourself, <laughs> but you, you are yourself anyways, but you do what's the best at every given moment from this free flow and in complete kind of checking, you know, like the bats checking what the environment is about and receiving uh, the, 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 the signal mm -hmm. and adjust, adjusting the trajectory accordingly. Well, like that. So you're sending out the, the signal, yeah. what's the situation about? And then you have uh, the mom's suit, the, uh, uh, the spiritual teacher's suit, uh, no suit at all. You can be completely yeah. naked and yourself. Traveling suit, Traveling including suit, uh, uh, <laughs> passing the, the, the borders with border police, you know, all these things. Yeah. You have like a separate suit to dive into those locations. Yeah. Speaking with people who, uh, who are fully into vaccines, suit, 
you know, and, and not, not trying to, to get it your way at, at all costs, mm -hmm. but really taking it in a, in a game of, mm -hmm. uh, of, yeah, game of life. Claudia. Mic on. Just put the mic on, please. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, yeah, because this is something, well, you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning be, to be me, but I, this is a question. You just tapped into something that I've questioned all my life because as a multicultural heritage, living all over the planet, well, all over the planet, you know, living in South America, living in Europe, and now in Southeast Asia, I always question myself that I have to put all these skins. If I am who I am, truly, in Southeast Asia, I actually arise anger and a lot of judgment or uncomfortable, you know, uncomfortable situations from people because they're not, um, com uh, you know, they don't accept me fully because I can be controversial in just my own Latin American skin. <laughs> and, and so then I, then I, after all this journey of multicultural heritage, my, my family comes from all over the planet. I'm part Lebanese and whatever. And then after all this, I have questioned who I am because I kind of forgotten my own, own authenticity because I've put on all these skins because I need to fit in Italy. I have to fit it in Southeast Asia. I have to fit in Europe or in the English crowd or a South American crowd. You have to be aware of what you say with the, you know, you cannot talk to the French with, a, with all that you say to, in, you know, to your good friend. So I don't know, it, I have questioned this so far and I, I don't know, I, now I'm all these skins and that part of me who is truly me, you know, doesn't dance anymore, <laughs> doesn't do certain things yeah. because uh, it's just, you know, I don't find a crowd or it's just not looked at acceptable or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I wanted, yeah. I wanted to hear your views. Great question, Claudia. Actually, I completely understand where you're coming from. And that's, you know, this is this part that we are explaining. You have first part of the journey and you have a second part of the journey. First part of the journey is Mandatory shedding skins. all of those skins that you have put on as a protection layer because you were not allowed to be yourself and actually getting to find that true self. That is the first part of the journey. Before you have found it, you cannot play with this playfully uh, play with uh, uh, the making new skins because it yeah. still hurts yeah. because you still are holding some of those shields because they were there necessary for you to have. But uh, when you have successfully done the first part of the journey and you have asserted that uh, true self and you understand there's nothing in the world anymore that can move me out of this position, then you can playfully Mm -hmm. start making them as per need but it cannot come before you have first dismantled all those old layers like old i don't know venezuelan part you know part lebanese mm -hmm. part all of these were protective skins and i had them i know what you're talking about i lived 20 years in the united states i had to have like strong interface with united states culture to even kind of you have to not scare people or to you know even be able to talk to them but uh, it took high levels of inner work to dismantle these skins, to stay in the inner, you know, like calmness and peace of true being. And then now I can play with these, you know, I don't, they're not there out of necessity. Now I'm creating them and discreating them at will. Thank you. I guess that by letting me see this, I guess uh, something will heal and it will transmute and I'll get there. So I mean, I, I still have work to do. But thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Well, you, you know, it but, might even look the same, the same, like those skins that you were unconsciously wearing before, you might recreate them, but then it would be your choice. This is my alter ego for Venezuela. This is my alter ego for family. This is my that. But you are conscious about it, and you are you are inhabiting it for the time being. And they easily come on and back. off. You know, they're not anymore like sticking, and we feel that we are, uh, you know, bound by the cage of that skin. They're just coming on and off at will because mm -hmm. you know 
and you feel with calmness, calmness is actually important uh, a test whether you are there or not. That you're like kind of calm and playful about it because you don't care. It's like, you know, you're just mm -hmm. putting it on and off how yeah. you want. Let, let's be my for family self, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as Sadhguru says, those egos, those alter egos, are you roll it out and roll it back in per need. And when you have a control over them, they don't hold, have control over you. Mm -hmm. So you have no confusion of who of them are you because you're none of them. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all at your disposal to be used for, for all kinds of situations. And in this light, look at the picture of uh, this sharing. We had that suit, but there's nobody is in. So this is what we are putting on. The, uh, the title picture, the yeah. suit with nobody inside. Uh -huh. So we have Eve and then Bella. Um, I just wanted to share, I don't know if it's helpful to anyone, but this, this idea of uh, it's all us and um, what we're really seeing here. But I know that from my, my own personal experience, which was uh, induced with the help of ayahuasca, was that when I, when I went through the, the, the death phase and then had that rebirth experience with the help of the medicine, there was this undeniable sense of, I'm going to use the word forgiveness because it's, it sort of sums it up, but it was, it was this kind of like, oh, I'm, you know, in your, in your, in, through this kind of conversation, internal dialogue, I was like, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I hurt my child here and I did this and I did this and I said this and I, and this, this, it was unmistakable that the voice, the feeling that came back was like, sorry, did you think you did any of that? Like, did you think that that was you? Like, don't be so arrogant. It was like, you know, we are just a, a just a vessel. And it's interesting that you're talking, you know, because we watched uh, that man Magnificent last night. And uh, it took me almost a year. You, know, you mentioned it ages ago. You suggested it. And it kept coming back, like, watch this, watch this. And, and there's this point where she goes to stab her finger. But she is like a zombie. You know, she has to find, no matter what, to put her you know it's like we get taken over like at some level I, you know we're not what we don't even know what we are <laughs> you know it's such a uh a cosmic level and the way you're talking right now is this 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 idea of this multi-dimensional being that we are and once we allow these characters to come through us because that's what's needed in that time and space and actually sometimes we are going to be assholes you know and and we have to kind of be okay with being that asshole you know and it's it's a tough job it's a tough job to just sit with that totality and you know sometimes quite frankly be a monster and go like whoa but then it's that prayer that devotion that that willingness to be a part I think the frequency starts to change with you surrendering to that process over and over again and then you get the higher qualities the shan the shadows transcended and then you find your gift state and you have a different people sitting at your table as your counsel and it's um yeah, it's really, it's, it's definitely a fun journey. Yeah. I, I, yes, you, I, I would just share, I have a beautiful example that came into my mind. In my guest house came a man who, who looked very, you know, like big and a little bit scary and all that. I'm serving the breakfast and there's ant crawling and he's, oh, little being like, come, 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 come. And uh, taking the ant very gently away from the table. And then I'm like, you know, but he looks kind of impressive. And I was asking, so what it is that you do uh, here in, uh, in the mountains? He said, ah, I'm, I'm um, uh, shooting a movie and what's your character? Well, I'm kind of the bad guy torturing children. <laughs> they're like, oh, how do you live with that, uh, you know, role? He says, well, I'm paid for it. <laughs> and apparently, you know, look at my physics, like it fits the, the purpose. Mm -hmm. And I was dwelling for a long time on that, on that ease, you know, how he was gentle to the end. And then he, five minutes later, he goes and plays torturing children uh, in a movie. So mm -hmm. this is the difference between our multidimensional self that in mm -hmm. one life tortures someone, in one life being tortured, in one life staying neutral. And we have no idea why we do the things we do. So let's ease up on that 
self-judgment because we have no idea. Maybe you're actually paid to be the bad guy in, in this life. And you're like, oh, oh, it's not just, it's not cool. Well, know? it's like that, that movie Anna suggested. I can't remember the name, but Seven, The Sevens or something. Wasn't it similar to that movie? Uh, we watched it the other, you know, there was like that movie role and he had like different, he played different characters in each level. Yeah. Bedazzled. No, um, Anna, you're here, aren't you? Uh, that movie that you suggested, this, the nines, the nines or something? Nines, yeah, there is nines or sevens or nines. I don't remember. I mean, you, re you remember yeah. the movie though, right? Yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah. reminded me of the characters that you're just playing over and over again. Yeah. There were several. There's also the split, the movie split about 24 inner personalities and all that. The nines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nines, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So contemplate, and the more you challenge yourself into these, uh, these views of, uh, am I, do I really know why I do the things I do and how justified I am to withhold myself for the sake of imaginary uh, peace in the world, well, always, always put a little break and, uh, and examine the situation as it stands in that moment. Mm -hmm. And Bella. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify something or ask a, for a clarification basically on a previous question. So I have the same issue with the multi dimension or, you know, multicultural personalities and stuff. But I guess my question is is it necessarily that the road is, um, aren't there overlaps? Meaning, you know, sometimes you reach that. The top of that mountain and then you have that insight about certain aspects of the self and then you go down and then you sometimes you have to go back up or do you think it's simply like once you get there then you don't have to go back up again you know because uh, sometimes i feel like it's a uh it's it's a back and forth so that's what makes it difficult right like if, if it was like a point where you reached and you knew that there was nothing else to do in terms of self-discovery that would have made it easier, but I almost feel like it's a, uh, there are lots of overlaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mountain goes on and on and on. If mm -hmm. we look at it in mountains or the cosmic consciousness goes deeper and deeper and deeper and there's never end. Mm -hmm. And it just goes deeper into the more levels of multidimensionality. If you want to hear more about it, listen to that interview that I have posted after our last or, or before last, session with uh, session. I think I saw it yeah I think I thought of yeah. watching it but now I will watch it for sure okay audio so you will just listen but it just illustrates how what are the those depths of levels of consciousness that you can experience and only the first ones deal with your personal self then collective self and then even out of that planetary galactic it is so so going deeper and deeper and deeper and it's amazing that engagement in uh, living cosmic consciousness on all of those levels, the higher the level or deeper the level, the less of inter immediate sharing can happen because people are so out of touch with these levels. As we mentioned two sessions ago, they're happy to be only on two levels, me and my body and me and my roles. So... Anything that's beyond that is already starting to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the question to answer your question, yeah, you keep going back and higher and higher and higher on that mountain, and you keep experiencing more and more of cosmic, cosmic consciousness on your journey. Yeah. And yeah, but then, but no, as, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah. as, as a general rule, if you feel that you have settled on the mountain top or a platform, that's where you have to be really careful. Because you are right. allowed to sit on a platform for a day or two or a week, but not more. And then the next container right. of consciousness is uh, revealing itself. So when you think right. you're out there, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> that means, <laughs> that means uh, uh, somebody will kick you in your behind to, to keep going. Yeah? To get out <laughs> or yeah, keep moving. No, but I guess my question is then, then if, if, if it is a, a road where you have to, like, you have to go up the mountain and come, come down to, like you said, but um, what, what, what you shared there, you know, like, for example, this whole idea that you said, like, you know, you, you can't, when you're 
unraveling these different layers of yourself, you have to do it almost like without thinking about them too much and what the effect will be on others, like, like really delving into being your authentic self. But then where do you draw the line? And, you, you know, uh, I guess like, how do you know which part of the road you're on, right? Because um, sometimes it could, it could feel that, you know, if you do keep your authentic self, then you're not making that journey far, far enough up, right? Uh, but then if you, you know, doing it too much, then you're hurting others, you're not really... The inner peace, you know, the inner peace. Inner peace. Indicates again, that it's again, it's that inner evaluation, right? <laughs> inner From down to that, who you are and where you are, are are at any given moment is the criteria. There's no, literally, no other way to know. Okay. Like that, and uh, so we have come to the end of of the sharing and uh, to you david specifically you know i've been chameleon all my life and it's my favorite animal anyways i have been fascinated by you know i could stare i would go to the zoo just to see chameleons and at the intricacy of how and what they are made out of and imagine that chameleons actually they don't have a colorful like they don't have color in themselves there's a process that scientists have not understood. How do they produce this uh, intricate pattern of color that matches the, the surroundings? So they don't have like full scheme of colors inside of their body, but they produce it skillfully at will, depending on the background. So you can really like take a little chameleon video for three minutes and you'll see how how they know they don't examine okay green so let's get green let's put the green button they feel what the background is and they automatically their skin Adapt. takes the color of uh, mm -hmm. what needs to be for that surrounding they don't figure it out they don't really paint themselves with the paint physically mm -hmm. yeah and as as fast as they get into that state as as fast they dissolve it so being a chameleon is quite a, a good uh, strategy to, to go through life mm -hmm. with minimum friction, uh, mm -hmm. however we can. Mm -hmm. Claudia, the final words. I just, I just want to, you reminded me of um, this healer who, she was quite galactic and she was in an accident on the, on the metro. And I think she was, um, I think she was in France and when the accident happened, the, 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 it was a Russian man who got hurt. And all of a sudden, she, don't know, she doesn't know how, she started speaking, speaking Russian to the guy and he got help and everything. And, and everybody in her partner asked him, I didn't know you spoke Russian, me neither. <laughs> so I don't know, and she's quiet. She, she's, her talent is to be, um, you know, with a voice and she can, you know, she can jump from one language to another without her knowing how and, but it was what you just said as a chameleon, you know, she, all of a sudden the body reacts to something and unconsciously because of, I guess, the stress of the situation brought this language to her mind and I don't know how, but sorry, just, I just wanted to give that point and I don't know, it's, it's reverent, I think it is, but maybe mm -hmm. it's old. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's being in such osmosis with the, with the surroundings and with the world that what is the best interaction comes naturally. You know, as per need, as we said, be yourself and do what's the best. So, and doing what's the, what's the best will come from being in osmosis with uh, the moment. Yeah. Like we like to say surfing. So you have brought the skill of surfing, but you have no idea where you're going to turn left or turn right or go up and go down. You will go as the wave dictates and uh, you will just improvise in the moment mm -hmm. with that skill that you have. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the great analogy. By being ready to be whatever you need to be at that moment. Mm. So, okay, voila. beautiful ones. That's so. it for today. Hope it, it, it stretches your mind beyond <laughs> authenticity <laughs> yeah. and be, beyond any concepts. And beyond attachments, yeah. 
mm-hmm. beyond attachments and beyond suffering. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Very nice session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.